standard deviation of the residuals in R squared. By the end of this video, you should be able to interpret the standard deviation of the residuals in R squared and use these values to assess how well a least square regression line models the relationship between two variables. And you should also be able to describe how the least square regression line, standard deviation of the residuals, and R squared are influenced by unusual points. All right, so our scenario today is can you guess my IQ? So as part of a new transcript at our school, the counselors have decided to include an IQ score in addition to GPA. Will knowing the GPA help predict IQ? So that's our thought as we go into this. So we have five students requested that the counselors update their transcripts for them. Adam, Bernard, Christy, Deja, and Eldon. Their IQ scores are 110, 85, 120, 95, and 105. But they have all been mixed up and the counselors don't know which IQ score goes with which student. The guidance counselors are forced to predict the IQ for each student. Each counselor takes a different approach. So counselor number one, he's the new guy. He just started, fresh out of school. So the new guy is so nervous about being wrong that he wants to play it safe with his prediction and minimize his error. He decides to find the average IQ score and use it as his prediction for all five students. So when you add up all five Q, uh, IQ scores and divide by five, you come up with 103. So he's going to use 103 as a predicted IQ for each individual. All right, now we have the veteran counselor. The veteran noticed that the equa an equation written on the board in the AP stats room, because we just happen to have that laying around. And the equation is IQ equals 16 times GPA plus 57.3. She realized that GPA can help her make better decisions. She looks up the GPA of each student. So here are our students' GPAs, okay? So what I want you to do is I want you to pause the video and take their GPAs, plug it in for GPA, and find their predicted IQ. All right, so for my predicted IQs, I got 86.1 for Adam, 95.7 for Bernard, 103.7 for Christy, 111.7 for Deja, and 118.1 for Elton. And finally, we have the last counselor, the truth seeker. The guidance counselor, this guidance counselor, pulled the five students out of class and found the truth. So Adam is actually has an IQ of 85. Bernard actually has an IQ of 95. Christine has an IQ of 110. Deja 105. And Eldon 120. All right, let's flip over and see what we can do. So now let's see who made better predictions. Between counselor one and counselor two, because they didn't go and find the truth, who made the better predictions for, between them? So we have the new guy who averaged the IQs for everybody. So his predicted IQ for everyone was 103. Okay, now we're gonna find the residual. The error is the residual, actual minus predicted. I want you to go fill those in. And then I want you to take that number and square it. And that's where you're gonna put this here and then add up all the sum, the sum of the squares, add them all up, and put that total there. Stop the video and come back when you're ready. All right, let's see how you did. So here are my squared residuals. And when I add up all of my squared residuals, I got 730. So now what I want you to do is the same thing for counselor number two. Go to the front of the paper to predicted IQ. Write them in here, find the residual, and then square the residual and find the sum here. Start the video again when you're done. All right, let's see how you did. So I took the squared residuals and I added them up and I got a total of 89.89 for the sum of the squared errors for counselor two. Now, who did better and why do you think? So go ahead and <clears throat> pause the video, answer that question. All right, so counselor two did better because the sum of her squared errors, 89.89, was less than the sum for counselor two, and counselor two summed errors was 730. So our summed errors 
for Counselor 1 was 730. For Counselor 2, it was 89.89. All right, so we're going to calculate the improvement from Guidance Counselor 1 to Guidance Counselor 2. So um, from Guidance Counselor 1 to Guidance Counselor 2, we want to know the percentage difference. So we're going to subtract them and we're going to divide by 730. And when we give that, we get 640 divided by 730, which equals 0 0.877. Okay, so that's the percentage improvement between Counselor 1 and Counselor 2, 87, almost 88 percent. So can we find each counselor's typical error? Um, so we're going to find the Guidance Counselor 2 typical error. So Guidance Counselor 2 had a sum of errors of 89.89. Typical means average. So we're going to divide by 5 to find the average. However, this number came from squaring the residuals. Remember doing that? So you need to take a square root of it also. So when you calculate that all out, I got that the typical error for counselor number two was 4.24. If we look at counselor number one, what are we gonna get? So you're gonna take 730 divided by five and take the square root of that. Square root of 146. And I got an average error of 12.08. So obviously, she was better, closer to each person. Now, what I want you to do is you're going to go to an applet. And I made a bigger copy of this QR code because I didn't put a QR code on yours. So you're going to follow this to this applet. And what you're going to do, I'm going to move the paper out to so make sure you scanned it, is we're going to input this data. So your applet should look like this. Now, let's put in our information. We have an explanatory and we have a response variable. And we're saying that GPA explains IQ. That's how this story was set up. So our explanatory is GPA. And IQ is our response. And we're going to input our GPA data. You can put print, um, you can put commas between or just a space, whichever is easier for you. Okay. Now, we'll put in the actual IQ for each person. It needs to be in the same exact order that you put in the other. Let's see what happens. We're going to begin analysis. And it gives us a scatter plot. So we see it's a positive, linear looking. I don't see a curve. Um, I'd say it's a fairly decent um, correlation coefficient. This dot out here is going to drop the correlation just a little bit. So let's calculate our correlation to see. 0.936, okay, that's pretty good. Now our regression model, we're going to calculate the least square regression line. It gives us the equation, but it also throws it back up here, so I wanted to come back up here and look. So this is the very best line that can be drawn through here. It reduces the error by the most. You could draw other lines, but this is the very best one, so that's what we always want to use. 
If we take a, a look at our residual plot, we can see it's scattered. I'm not seeing an exact, I got some down and some up. So about half of them are under and about, just it's an odd number, so we can't have half and half. But I don't feel like there's a pattern with that, so I think a line is a pretty good model here. But let's take a look at, we have our equation, and then we have some other information here. So we have our correlation coefficient, which we got up above, which is 0.936. Our R squared, you can see right here, is 0 0.877. That sounds kind of familiar to me. I'm wondering if it sounds familiar to you. And S, S is the standard deviation of the residuals. So that's 5.4. Seven, three. All right, so let's take a look here. So we've got some information. We got the correlation coefficient. And then it, we've got this number for R squared. And I want you to take a look here, down to here. R squared, they're the same number. R squared is really telling you how good a job your line will do at predicting a score. So counselor number two will have a much better time having her line predict a score than counselor number one. Okay, so it's a very similar to this idea, but you won't ever have to calculate it out. You can get it through doing the R squared where you do stat calc. Um, eight for your linear regression and pull it out of there. Uh, your standard deviation of the residuals. <clears throat> I'm not going to tell you how to calculate this. It's usually given to you. You just have to understand what it is. Now when we did this, we actually were looking for the average, the standard deviation. Those are not the same. Well, they are close. So here's why. That formula is going to divide by the sample size minus 2. And we actually divided by the sample size. It's a statistical thing to account for error and stuff like that. So this is something that you can, um, you're not ever going to calculate by yourself. You'll get be given it, and you're really going to just be interpreting it. So we were really close, but this is where the standard deviation of the residual come from. It's the average distance away from the mean, but they don't divide by the total. They divide by the total minus two. So our numbers were a little bit different. All right, let's look at the second page here and let's summarize some of this down. Okay, so I have two things I'm gonna tell you, so you can split it about there. So the two things that we talked about today that were kind of big, the standard deviation of the residuals, all right, so our standard deviation of the residuals, remember it's noted by a lowercase s here, that's standard deviation of the residuals. So when you go to interpret it, which is the most likely thing you're going to have to do, so you want the actual Y context. Remember, you're going to write in what the Y context is. Do not write the words Y context. Tell me what it is. Is typically about whatever the standard deviation of the residuals is away from the number predicted by the least square regression line. And in here, you need to add some context. Whatever. Okay. All right. So to interpret, it's the actual Y context is typically about S away from the number predicted by the least square regression line. You're going to want to throw some context in. What, what kind of number are they talking about? Okay. And our second one that we talked about was our coefficient of determination. And we just ever always call it R squared. It's literally the correlation coefficient squared, okay? So to interpret this, you're going to write about R squared. You're going to convert R squared to a percentage, about blank percent 
of the variability in the y context, whatever y is, can be accounted for by the least square regression line. And that's a lot to write out, so usually we just write LSRL. All right, when you're done writing this, I want you to pause the video and I want you to go back to your applet that we just used and I want to have you use it uh, to answer the check your understanding. Here is your QR code in case you closed it and uh, pause the video, get this all done and then come back and check to see how you did. All right, let's see how you did. So when we input all of our data into the app, I got a regression line, a least square regression line of y hat equals 16.265 plus 0.091x. If you don't have the hat on there, you're going to lose points because remember this is a prediction, but I'd really like you to write it in context. The y hat is the prediction of body backpack weights and the x value represents body weight. Okay. Your S, your standard deviation of your residuals, should have been 2.27. When we interpret it following how we, you were told to interpret, the actual backpack weight is typically about 2.27 pounds away from the weight predicted by the least square regression line. And then your R squared. Your R squared was 0.632, so that translates to about 63.2% of the variation in backpack weight can be accounted for by the least square regression line. Really, you want a higher number. Um, that's a kind of low prediction rate. You want to be pretty confident in your predictions. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, let me know if you have any questions, and I'll see you in class.